welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. As Major General in the National Guard of the Maryland Military, my guest today is the first African American and first woman to head up all military operations for one state and make national news when under her command, her team became the first all-female National Guard Command staff in the U.S. Her military career spans over 30 years of service in both the enlisted and officer ranks. She has served at many levels of command and staff assignments, two of which were overseas deployments to Kosovo and a combat tour to Afghanistan supporting Operation Enduring Freedom. She is a multi-award winning recipient and decorated officer. As part of her military role, she worked with senior level officials in Estonia and Bosnia, developing country strategies under the Department of Defense State Partnership Program. With decades of leadership, consulting, and system integration experience serving at senior executive level positions, she offers a blend of public and private sector experience that spans health, defense, state, and local government. Now an entrepreneur, she is founder and CEO of Kaleidoscope Effect, a company that provides leadership, strategic advisory services, and solutions to drive positive and measurable growth through change and innovation. She personally mentors, coaches, and speaks on leadership, diversity, adversity, career transition, and issues that plague women and veterans in the workplace. Holding a bachelor's degree in business, a master of business administration, a master of strategic studies, and a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology, she is also the author of Moments of Choice, My Path to Leadership, and What's in Your Box, which is scheduled to be released this year. Welcome, Dr. Linda Singh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. So nice to have you. I <clears throat> read a little excerpt from your first book, Moments of Choice, My Path to Leadership, that really resonated with me. And it was the story about your trip to Kabul and your mission there and the value of our freedom of choice in everything we experience. Can you tell our audience a little bit about that experience and the insight that came from, from that? Well, you know, having um, served there for almost a year, it really was a life-changing experience because you, you got a chance to see how um, a country can be torn apart by war and how things can be just so drastically different for everyone who lives there. Because, you know, if you go back to, uh, you know, many, many, many years before that, it was a thriving area. And then to see it kind of just torn apart and then, you know, not realizing that, you know, anywhere you go, uh, especially as a, a service member, you had to be very careful in terms of, you know, the danger that you were in. Um, but the site that, I guess the, the thing that hit me the most is I, I went out to do really what we call a humanitarian support event with some of the teams. And we went to a wide variety of, of locations, but this one particular location, we were going to um, deliver clothes and some items to a homeless, um, kind of like a, almost a displaced person's uh, campsite. And it was cold. And, you know, here you see these kids walking around with no shoes and um, they were just happy that we were there. And it was just, you know, to watch the little girls see me and to really just watch them be in awe. Um, you can't help but to let that impact you and, and you don't even speak the same language. And um, as you're trying to communicate with them and you're using an interpreter, it really was um, very, cha it, it changed me in terms of the way that I looked at the place and the way that I felt about coming back home. Mm -hmm. um, because there they were homeless and so happy. Um, you know, they were living in cardboard boxes and different places and it was just, it was, it was a little crazy. Yes, it, it um, you said in, <clears throat> excuse me, in your book that you learned the value of every choice and experience that we make and yeah. not to take our freedom of choice for granted because Absolutely. we often do. 
Um, but it, it was very poignant and I really enjoyed it. Uh, <clears throat> in that book, you say that your transition from abuse and homelessness to becoming major general in the United States Army and an executive with leading global professional services company came from a series of moments in choice. Share with us those choices and what they are. Well, I mean, when I started out, uh, I uh, left home and was homeless for a period of time before joining the military. And I had even quit high school. So I didn't get my high school diploma until about a year after I had been in the military. And so when you make those choices, there are certain consequences that come with that. And so every choice that you make along the way does have a level of, comp uh, a, a level of consequence, whether it's good or bad. And you almost have to, to think about it as an, okay, well, that didn't work. So what's the next thing you need to try? And I think, you know, while I was in the midst of it, I'm not real sure that I realized um, just how crazy it was that I was going from one thing to the next. I, I didn't really have a home. It was almost like I had a, a requirement to survive and I was doing whatever I needed to to survive. And then, you know, trying to really work to be able to get my education and what landed me being able to get a job in consulting and really change the trajectory for my career was finishing my undergraduate degree, which took 10 years to get done. And then having a friend who actually had worked at the company where I was and he left and went to this consulting company as an HR recruiter. And he reached out to me. And so he just remembers that I was not happy where I was and I wanted something different more and I wasn't necessarily going to get it where I was. And so if it wasn't for a number of people, you know, believing in me and giving me, you know, that chance, right? They gave me the opportunity, but then it was up to me to be able to walk through that door. And so it is, you know, your, your life is about uh, a wide variety of choices. And sometimes those choices can be made for you. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you, you have to think about, you know, when other individuals make a choice for you and you kind of land in a situation, um, you have to figure out how you're going to get out of that. Right, right. I didn't, that, I like that you said sometimes it's choices that other people make for you and, and whether or not you take that action, but that was very intuitive. I know that you shared that you made choices in, in the sense of um, choosing forgiveness over resentment and love over fear, discipline over recklessness, and hard work over dependency. I, that was in your book, and I just loved it. I thought it was, it was so profound, um, that the lessons that came to you during this period in your life. And although you came from humble and troubled beginnings, you found the courage at a very early age to leave it all behind. And I was really curious, where do you think you got that strength? And what advice would you give someone who may be using their circumstances to hold them back? Well, so I think there's a couple of things. First, my grandmother who raised me for nine years was an extremely strong woman. I mean, she raised 14 kids, oh. right? So she gave birth to 17, raised 14 because three died. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, she never complained and like we did not have a lot. And when I think about what she went through and, and when I became older, I realized how much she did for us. Mm. Um, even though my, my uh, mom was not the greatest, we didn't get along, she was hardworking. Like mm. it was, you know, she basically said to us that you have to work hard. And when I look at all the women in my family during those times, they all worked. And so it was normal for me to see that, um, okay, women work. And I just thought that was normal. Um, when I started, you know, being with other women who, um, I guess had either husbands that stayed at home or they were able to stay at home. That was a little unusual for me because I was just like, well, wait a minute. I mean, my family, all the women just work, right? It's what you're supposed to do. So, um, and so I think the strength came from, you know, seeing that and realizing that, um, you know, things can be really bad, but you know, you don't have a choice. You really do have to work for it. And sometimes things just don't happen as fast as you would like. And 
I think it was, you know, having that instilled in me allowed me to continue to try to find ways and to get around really bad circumstances, right? And I knew that if I could just make it another day, maybe tomorrow would be different. Right. So anyone who might be feeling stuck in circumstances, maybe just reach out or take, a, maybe look at something from a different viewpoint. And like you said, tomorrow is another day and, and yeah. just, you know, continue to move forward. Because I, I think that sometimes we all get stuck. I mean, that's just life. But it's, it's, it's what we do with that. And I really, I think your roots really gave you that strength. Like you said, everyone in your family, all the women worked. And, you know, that, that wasn't a bad thing. That was a good thing. And, and because you did have courage at a very early age. And I thought that was so impressive um, to, to take those steps. Now, you wrote that along your way through life that you had mentors and role models that you who assisted you and how can mentors and role models help women looking to pivot in their life and business? And do you have any suggestions where we might start looking for mentors and role models? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing that I would say is, you know, during the time that I was coming up and even now, you know, women may not have necessarily as many uh, other women role models. And so don't just look to other women to be, you know, the role model, you can look to men mm -hmm. um, to actually serve as those role models as well. And believe it or not, you can actually learn some amazing things from our male counterparts, um, you know, how they do business and how can you change um, some of the things that you think about in the way that they do business and bring that into kind of your own framework. And so you need to, to look for mentors within your workplace because you may be able to find them there. Sometimes in your community, there may be, um, you know, and I say community much broader. I try to associate with different groups where I'm going to be able to learn something. And so you can find mentors within, within that. And, you know, the, the thing that I want to make a distinction is there are mentors, there are coaches, mm -hmm. and then there are sponsors. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing that I started really learning is that when you have a sponsor, that sponsor um, not only is going to be looking out for you and, and on your behalf, but when you're not in the room, they're the ones that are going to have those conversations of support. It is so important to have someone that is willing to be your sponsor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, where they're going to be able to have that seat at the table and you may not, you know, you won't, you won't be there. And, and that was key. That was instrumental all through my career. I can, you know, really name all the different people who were absolutely, you know, a sponsor supporting or they were talking on my behalf. They were making sure that I was getting the opportunity. And, you know, you didn't always see it when you were going through it, but then you turned around and you're like, oh my gosh, they were really looking out for me. Right. They're almost like your cheerleader. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, because you're right. They're role models that we can all look up to. And then there are mentors and then sponsors. I, I, I believe the sponsor gets a lot more involved with you personally and that you're right. It, it, if we can all find sponsors, that would be wonderful in helping us go forward. Your personal development value is one that might be considered a little difficult to implement in today's fast paced world. And you said it's go slow to go fast. So what is that and what makes it a value in one's development today? Well, I think sometimes we're going, 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 and we never take the time out to contemplate, am I on the right road? Am I going in the right direction? And oh, by the way, is this valuable for where I need to go? Mm -hmm. um, and we can spend so much wasted time and so the thing that I've learned is that sometimes you do have to go slower in order to get that speed, in order to get the, the momentum. And it doesn't mean like we're going through life very slow. It just means that you have to have that time to strategize. And you should not only be strategizing about if you're in business and you're an entrepreneur, what your business is, you should have a strategy and a business plan for your business. And then you should have a personal strategy and a business plan for you personally. Because if you're not doing those two things, um, you're not growing 
in order to be able to provide the, the need and the support that your business is going to need. So I think it's Im important for us to take that time out to contemplate, are we even on the right road? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if we're playing the game of checkers, um, is it the game that you want to play for where you need to go? Maybe you need to be playing chess. And so you have to take that time. Right. Yes. And I like that you said um, to reflect on the value. It, you know, if is there is there value in, in what I'm doing here? And I've never heard anyone say to do one for your, I heard the business strategy, but not personal. So that's very interesting. In, in our earlier conversation, of course, it became very clear, speaking of strategy, that you are a very strategic thinker and planner. And I love that about you. And did you always have this aptitude or did you gain it over the years? And it's particularly with your background in the military. Yeah, so I didn't always have it, or at least I didn't think that I always had. It's really funny. You know, we see ourselves in certain ways. And so I've worked with um, a gentleman mm -hmm. at Accenture and he was a strategy type and when him and I started working together I actually worked for him I used to admire how he could just you know really have this deep thinking ability and I'm just like where did he get that from <laughs> <laughs> yeah give me some <laughs> and I never really seen myself doing that and so one day I just said to him I said well you're good at strategy I'm not good at strategy right I'm good at the operational and the tactical. And he just stopped me and he goes, I disagree. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa. <laughs> wow. And if he had not pointed that out to me and we had a long conversation about it and that was really a revelational moment for me where someone else and other people were seeing me as, as someone that was a deep thinker. And then I had to figure out, well, how do I get comfortable with that? And how do I just let it, you know, just to let it flow? Because I never considered myself to be that. Right. And so it, it kind of, that was a, one of those light bulb moments that allowed me to say, okay, now I can lean into this a little bit more. Right. Well, yeah, some, you're right. Sometimes we don't see our own gifts um, and we're too close, but it's wonderful when you do have those individuals that can see them and then help you bring it forward. And you made a decision then recently to become an entrepreneur. Um, what made you decide to make that shift? When you've spent um, almost 40 years having someone else tell you, you know, you need to work this project or you need to go to this place or you need to do this, um, and you realize that you have all of these things that you've now collected, but there's only certain things that you really enjoy doing. Mm. So it was the chance for me to be able to shape what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Now, granted, yes, I could probably do that if I, if I chose a different job or, you know, I went to a different company, but this allows me to be able to create and it is putting me in, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in a space that I'm really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So this is putting me in a very uncomfortable space. And why I, I like that is because I've seen so much growth when I'm in that uncomfortable space. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait to see what's going to come out of this. And I'm learning, you know, new things. And granted, I've worked consulting almost all my life. And I'm learning things as an entrepreneur and business owner that I don't think I would have ever learned having just worked in a, in a company for someone else. The challenge, I see it as the challenge because when we're on that edge, that's where the growth happens. Yes. So, and I could see that's definitely in your personality. You like to learn and you like to continue growing. So that that's very, um, obvious in your in your career path when you see all the things that you've accomplished the name of your company is unique and holds special meaning to you explain what that is and why it holds special meaning i really wanted a company that represented the impact that i want to make in the world still and it really was about thinking how can i help people see the world differently and so Kaleidoscope, um, 
from each of our perspective, if I was to give you the same kaleidoscope that I'm holding, you're going to see very different things and very different colors depending on which way you turn it. And the effect of those changes is different. And so I named it kaleidoscope effect because I wanted it to, to represent being the change that you want to see in the world, right? And so my big thing is I want to be able to help my clients and individuals see the world very differently. Mm -hmm. I want them to see it through different eyes. And you can only do that when you come through like an evolution or you come through that change. And that's really the mission that I'm, I'm on is to be able to do that with whatever client that I engage with. I love that name. I mean, how clever is that? You obviously have creativity because it, it doesn't go with, uh, well, it does go, but it, it, when you, you understand what your business is, and we'll get into that a little bit further, it's very um, corporate almost in its feel and its sense, but the name says, hey, wait a minute, I'm different, and I love it. I, it's, it you stand out. Yeah. So what do you find the most challenging aspect of being your own boss? Finding the time to do every role because right now I'm really, really small. Um, so you play every single role. Um, when you have to submit a proposal, you're the proposal writer. When you have to do the finances, you're the finance person. That becomes extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be able to kind of step back and make sure that you're making all the right decisions. But you also have to be the salesperson. You know, you have to be the relationship builder. And so it is very challenging. But when I think back to my consulting years, I had to do the same thing as a consultant, as a partner in a company where your job is sales, it's revenue, um, it is, you know, profitability. And so it, it was the same thing. It's just that now I'm doing it for myself. Um, the big thing is I don't have the big machine and safety net behind me. So I have to think about strategic partners. I have to think about how am I going to bring this market offering, you know, going forward. And, it, and it's funny because yesterday I had a business call and it went so well that I'm realizing, oh my God, I need to have some re you know, I need to have some resumes that I'm good with ready to go because we're going to be that fast potentially and, and moving some things around. So I, I got off the call and I was feeling really good. And then I went into like panic mode and I was like, Oh my goodness, I have a lot to do. <laughs> yeah, I got the account. <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations. I'm not sure if contracts have been signed, but early congratulations. Oh, yeah. so, Got to take more time for that, but it was just such a, I mean, you, you, when you know you've got a, a match and you know that something good is going to come out of it, um, and then you start having that reality of, okay, now I need to really make this happen. Right. Now, now I have to step up to the plate. Yeah. But Absolutely. how exciting. I mean, there again, you're on the edge, right? Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. because it, it's like, oh boy, now somebody's really going to pay me for what I've said I'm going to do. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. that's, but wow, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yes, I know that an entrepreneur has to wear many hats and what we need to do is be aware of that but not let that stress us because yeah. that is one of the things that I hear very often is overwhelm and um, it can get to us uh, because an entrepreneur does have to wear so many hats. So mm -hmm. take those moments or, or just maybe plan your day so that it breaks it up and you're not trying to do everything at once. Yeah, that's, my husband has a saying, um, you don't have to eat the whole cow all at once. I know it sounds terrible, but it really, it really makes sense. You know, it's like, you don't have to do it all at once. That is so correct. I wanted to dig in here because I love your methodology and you are so strategic in your thinking as an entrepreneur and a businesswoman, um, as yourself and the general populace grows in numbers, you said that a business plan and outlining the structure should be in place from day one. Now, I know many female entrepreneurs, and that is one thing that we are not good at doing. We like to sort of, you know, go willy nilly, and um, I'm very creative, so I have that issue where I tend to go with the flow. But I, I loved our conversation earlier and you had specific points. So how do we begin to formulate a business structure or plan 
Now, what questions do we need to be asking ourselves and why is it vital to our success? So I know there's a lot of stuff to unpack there, but we'll start with the, you know, what do we need to be asking ourselves? I think the first thing and where I started is what is the business that I want to be in? What do I enjoy doing? And if, if it's what I enjoy doing, can I make money at it? Because that is a key thing. You may enjoy something, but you may not be able to make money doing that. So you, you really need to think about what you want to do and how are you you're going to bring that to fruition, which is what the business plan is all about. And I know that you know we don't like to do it. We can get in a very uncomfortable space. There's a lot of resources that are out there where you can create very simple one-page business plans. I mean, they don't have to be you know, 50 and 60 pages. And as a matter of fact, if they're 50 and 60 pages, you're probably never gonna read it. So make it as, as simple as possible, but it, it should allow you to be able to walk through you know, your vision, mission, and your overall goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. And then you have to lay out, if this is what you want to accomplish, then what's that timeline? So if you say in five years, I want to have my business fully established with these certifications, then lay out the plan that allows you to move through that. And that really is about not eating, you know, the whole elephant or the whole cow at one time, right? So it is, it's kind of breaking it down in bite-sized pieces, but it also allows you to be able to visualize mm. and to me, that's important. I, I do a lot of visualization exercises. And even after I finished that call yesterday, I knew that I had work to do. Mm. Last night, you know, my mind was really, I had to quiet my mind because I'm like, oh, you know, I need to reach out and I need to contact, you know, this group for this partnership and I need to do this. And it was just, you know, going through my mind sequencing. And so when I got up this morning, I'm like, great, I dreamt about it all night long. Let me write it down. <laughs> oh, no. right? so you, you need to have your plan so you can work on it, right. um, you know, just a little at a time. And, you know, even now I have my business plan, but I'm constantly revising it because mm. I'm finding that, you know, where I thought that I was going to be and where I, I thought that I wanted things, I've, I've been changing them over time because more and more ideas are coming up and I'm like, oh, I need to do this. That's going to make it a lot tighter. And I'm, so you really do need to have a, a plan that you're working on. Right, and, and make it fluid. Like you said, it's not carved in stone. Um, that's one of the actual advantages of being a small entrepreneur is that you can pivot very quickly. And you said that one of the things we need to put in place, like you were saying, if you need to get certificates or teaching, or if you need a website, some of the basics that we all take for granted, but uh, the resources, um, you said something really interesting that I had never thought of is from day one, you should be thinking of if you need partnership or if strategic alliances are something that would benefit you moving forward and maybe make a note of those. And uh, then what's your sales and marketing plan and how to attract clients? So all of that, and I like that you said it doesn't have to be multi pages because that was one of my other questions and a one pager will do, you know, don't, will do. don't get overwhelmed by, Oh, it's a business plan. You know, maybe we need to call it something else, but, but yeah, it's, it's basically, so you can take it from your head and put it on paper. Yes. And so then you can look at it. And like you said, you woke up this morning, you had your dream and then you started writing it all. Down. <laughs> Absolutely. Free up your mind. There is another one that you can use. It's called a business canvas and that's a one pager. Oh, okay. It's kind of like a, a one page business plan, but it's called a business canvas. Canvas? And, uh, a business canvas. And you can go out and get a book and it just shows you how to do it. It is the best thing ever. Wow. Is that, if you were to Google it, would you find it? If you were to Google it, you'd be able to find it. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful resource. Uh, I'll, everyone who's listening, be sure and check that. And I definitely will, for sure. Uh, you said earlier that your business structure doesn't need to be cookie cutter, because I did have that question for you on the phone, because when I said business plan, oh my gosh, you get, you know, you, you go online and just Google business plan. They've got all these structures in place and all these the things that you have to fill in. And you said it can be creative. Maybe just add a little bit to that. Yeah, I think the problem is that when we think of business plans and business structures, we think of this hierarchy. 
-hmm. And if you are a small business, you can really look at, okay, do I need to have, um, you know, 10 positions that are those high level positions? Well, no, maybe you don't. Maybe you only need three. Maybe you need to look at what's most important for you to have right now and then outsource the rest of those things. So the things that I'm looking at is I want to be able to outsource some of my human resources. Mm. Well, who am I going to partner with to do that? Because I don't want to bring that in house Mm -hmm. right now, right? It's expensive. Um, So I'm thinking of if it's not part of my core business, can I outsource it and get it in another manner while I am building? At some point I may need to bring it in house, Mm -hmm. but right now, um, you know, when I'm looking at that, I'm making a decision on what positions do I really need to have and which ones do I think are going to be most valuable for me being able to win future war. Right, right. Oh, that's, that's really good advice. And now I just had a quick question because you already answered the multi-page issue. When we're doing our business plan, is it something that is required for lawyers and or accounts to get involved? that depends on how complicated you want to make it right i didn't okay and i have my business plan Mm -hmm. Uh, for my financials it was very simple right i'm looking at my projections and what i need to have in place can you go and have somebody review it absolutely so if you are a small business um within every single state in in the u.s there's a small business administration there's a small business office locally that will do that for you for free. Or you can even go to the Small Business Administration, look at their site and they'll tell you where your locations are in your local area where you can get those resources for free. So I went to SCORE, which happens to be one of the Small Business Administration's organizations. And I got a a business mentor that helped me through looking at my business plan and he reviewed it for me. And he said, you know, you're going to need to continue to work on this. But he was the one that really, you know, just looked at it and gave me some great ideas. Hey, you need to to really think more about this. And it was really helpful. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Did, was that, did you pay for that or was that something that came through the, the services? It's a free service from the small business administration. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. This is very great information. I hope everyone's making notes. (laughs) You talked about narrowing the field in your business. And what does this mean and why is it important? Well, when you're thinking about your business and, you know, I, I actually um, coach some uh, chief executive officers that are small business owners and they start in all over the place. And I think the challenge with that is you need to focus because you're small, you can't be everything to everybody. Mm. And so you have to think about how you're going to narrow your field of focus. And so even if you look at my company, this next year, I'm focusing in on one, what I would consider to be kind of um, line of business within that. Mm. I want to be able to really get up and going because it, it allows me to do it easier. It allows me to be able to accomplish some of the goals and bring on more resources. And then I will go and expand out from there. So even though my company says, you know, I'm doing all of these different verticals, I'm actually even narrowing within the verticals of what I'm going to hit on the first year and where am I going to focus. That Um, makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And as entrepreneurs and business owners, you said that we need to know our lead cycle. Explain what that is and why it's important. If um, So the lead cycle is really all about how long is it going to take you to close a deal and to bring that into your organization and then get paid, Mm -hmm. right? So when you think about what that generation, that lead generation cycle is, I'm planning on doing a lot of work with the government. The lead time for government work can be years. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's one um, particular client that we've been going after. It's an international client. We have been cultivating this deal for a year and we still haven't closed the Mm -hmm. deal. So your lead cycle is much longer. And so 
you have to think about how are you going to approach that. And if your lead cycle is that long, let's just say you have six deals and none of them are scheduled to close in Q2. So we're kind of really in, in Q2, Q3, depending on your year um, of where you are and how you, you slice up your year, right? So we could be in Q2, could be in Q3, depending on what your years look like. Um, but if you were to, to look at that, you may not be bringing in any sales or revenue within the next six months if that, that cycle is a very long lead time. Right. So you have to start looking at projecting that out. And that's one of the things um, you should project out in your business plan. It allows you to lay out your sales and your revenue cycle. Um, so that to me is, you, you need to understand it. You need to understand the close time because that will also get into your cash flow. Right. And cash flow you're going to have. So that'd be very vital. And if you didn't anticipate that, then you'd be stressed. Um, you're right. If you anticipate it, depending on what, and I think no matter what, um, yeah, I mean, you're working with clients that in the sense of the government that would take many, many, uh, hopefully not years, but a long time to cultivate. Whereas let's say you're an individual selling a product or a coach, uh, you know, your lead cycle might be shorter, but you still need to address it because that's an issue that often happens with entrepreneurs is that they don't anticipate their lead cycle and then they stress because the cash flow isn't there. That's correct. So that yeah, that's correct. very vital. How important is it? I know you mentioned it briefly when we discussed the business plan, a mission statement and a vision statement. And should those be on your business plan? And what is the difference? Absolutely. Um, so your, your vision statement is really about your overall vision, right? That's a much broader scope. And then your mission statement is how you're going to go about it, right? This is how you are going to go about achieving that vision. Um, you know, what you're going to do on a daily basis almost. And so it's important to have both. I think some organizations would say, well, you need to have a vision statement. But if you don't have a, a mission statement, how do you know what your purpose you know, truly is? You'll know what the vision is, but you may not know what the core purpose of the objectives are going to be. And so you have to think about that a little bit. And I would say then you also need to have core values. Mm. I mean, how many people think about developing core values for their companies? Those core values should be part of what helps to drive and helps you to accomplish that vision. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. So are these three uh, topics, mission, vision, and core values, are those something that you should include on your business plan? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Wonderful. And give it some thought because like you said, it is important and that maybe keeps you on the straight and narrow when you start to go in another direction and then maybe bring it back or you can change it depending on what happens. But you wanted to tell us something about what we should be aware of when seeking venture capital. Yes. <laughs> so this one is, is challenging, right? Because what I see is there's a lot of entrepreneurs that um, they're going out and they're going to need to raise capital. So they may be developing an IT solution, an app or whatever it may be. And they're, and they're going to go out and raise capital. They need to be cognizant of how they do that. Um, when you're looking at raising venture capital, nine times out of 10, you're going to give up a certain positioning within your company, meaning you're going to give up so many shares, or you're going to have so much return on the money they're going to give you, which means they're going to get something. And if you're not careful, and, and what we see um, as I've been doing a lot of work in this space with TEDCO, um, you know, what you what you see is that companies almost give away everything. Mm. And then when you come out of that, you don't really own as much as the organization because you've kind of signed it away on paper. And then when you go to get a business loan, that can impact you very heavily, right? So if you're going to oh. transition from that venture capital into now wanting to get a business loan, um, you're going to have to ask or answer how much of the company do you own and how much equity do you have, right? Like how much is there? What is it worth? What's the asset? And so that can really get you um, in a bind if you're not thinking about that. 
It can also get you in a bind if you're going to go for, let's just say, women-owned business status for certification, right? A third-party certification. You have to own at least 51% of your business. Mm -hmm. You have to be in control of at least 51% of your business. Okay. And so you have to think about all of those requirements as you're looking at your strategy. To me, that's why having a business plan that kind of lays it out. And if you're going to raise capital, know what are you willing to give up mm -hmm. to raise that level of capital? And like, what's the, you know, what's the, you know, what does it really mean? And are you going to be able to gain it back? Like, how can you do a buyback? And at what point can you do a buyback? Yeah, that's very important. I hadn't realized, like you said, if you go to get a loan and then they want to know how much of the company that you own and you realize that it's not your company anymore. Uh, and then you're, I don't even know if you could get the loan without the, uh, the signature of the, the venture capitalist. So yes, that's really good advice. I know that's an unfortunate thing with venture capital because they do take uh, the majority of shares and uh, often uh, entrepreneurs lose their businesses. Yeah, okay. but, but that's really, really good advice. Thank you so much. You've written two books now. So my question to you, Linda, is when did you get bitten by the writing book bug? And is it something that you recommend an entrepreneur take on? Well, uh, wow. <laughs> I thought about writing a book for the first time coming out of my first deployment, right? I was there, I had a lot to think about. I happened to be watching Oprah <laughs> and I was watching a show and it really just hit me that, hey, I have a story to tell, but I wasn't really sure how to go about it. I knew that I had to, if I wanted to do it in the, the way that I was thinking, um, that was gonna make me very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, kind of exposed in a sense. And so I had to get really comfortable with that. And so my second deployment, I think really did it for me. I came out of that second deployment and I'm like, I've got to get this done mm -hmm. because it was then very important for me to be able to tell that story. It was hard. I mean, the first book, because it was really reliving everything that I had gone through, mm -hmm. a lot of what I had forgotten Mm. And it was really causing me to relive some very painful parts of, of my life. Mm. And then to figure out how do I move through that and not be ashamed. Right. So that was kind of, you know, the first one. And, and I would say that the first book was um, almost my coming out. Mm. Right? It, was a, it was releasing me. It took such a weight off my shoulders that I didn't have to live now in this, life that I felt like was a whole lie, right? I mean, I, I needed people to know. The, the second book um, really came about because I, I realized on one of my, my travels, and I was in Bosnia, Herzegovina, that um, there was more that I, I wanted to say, right? I, I felt like there was more that I want, wanted to impart, but it was not telling my life story. Mm. This was really about helping people move beyond like it is important that that you understand that what you put into your life is what you're going to get out of it mm. and and if you are just too afraid to deal with the really hard things then you're not going to get any rewards out of it right it's just going to be very lackluster and so it's not easy and i, I want people to to really see that you have to put in the hard work and you have to continue to chomp away at it, you know, one item at a time and what I call one chip at a time, right? You have to pay that chip forward in order to get the value out. And so the next book is about what's in your box. And it really is equating a box to your life. What you put in is what you get out. So how do we start challenging those preconceived ideas and notions that almost put handcuffs on us? Mm. And how do we break out of that? I wanted it to be out last year, but it was a lot harder to, to write this one. And I think, you know, fate had it in saying, okay, it's not ready. It can't come out. And with everything that's happened with the pandemic, um, you know, the book will be ready 
uh, to really be released, you know, sometime this fall. And I think it's the perfect timing because people are going to need to have that breakout moment. We are in such a weird space right now with so many different things happening. Mm -hmm. We need for ourselves a breakout moment. And so I'm going to be focusing in on trying to help folks get that breakout moment. That's wonderful. I can't wait because like I said, I read excerpts from your first book that I, I want to get and read and they're beautifully written. Uh, it's a story it, 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 and it just draws you in and I can feel how real it is. I, I feel in telling your story that was cathartic for you. I mean, that's how I feel because you said a weight was lifted off you by sharing this and that's wonderful. Um, you know, and that, that you have that gift, you know, in a sense that you were able to bring it and put it out there because you're right, it is very vulnerable and it is exposing yourself. But like, I think if we can do that, it helps us grow. I, I, I have, I feel that, that it can really help us grow, but it also can serve others to help them grow. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, and I, I love the title of your second book. It's just so interesting. And now, but now I get it. I was going to ask you why that title, but now of course it all makes sense. <laughs> so definitely. What is the most gratifying aspect of owning your own business? Well, I think I'm really, and, and as I'm structuring my business, I'm trying to, to do things that is going to not just grow my business because I have to be able you know, to pay my bills and things like that, but I wanna be able to help change circumstances maybe for some others. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking at how do I build into my business model a way for me to do that? And whether it is you know, my partnerships and the way that I'm looking at strategic partnerships is you have to be a woman-owned business a minority owned business or a veteran owned business. Mm. I'm not saying that I won't partner with large organizations, but what I am saying is for the strategic partners that I want to bring along behind me, um, I really want to be strategic about how I look at these partnerships. Mm. Is there a way that I can not only help my business to grow, but to you know bring someone else along and maybe they'll do that for someone else. And then my staffing model for part of my offerings, I'm really looking at how do I help contribute to jobs? And how can I do that for a group that may not necessarily get the opportunity? And that doesn't mean that I can do everything for every everyone, but I am looking at kind of developing a method and a structure where I'm dealing with the inner city. And how do I help bring, you know, if I can bring 10, into the business that I can help grow. And I get it, they're probably gonna get trained and skilled and they'll probably leave, but that's 10. And then if I can do 10 more. Right. And so I'm really trying to, to look at it as in the spirit, you know, what's been in the spirit of how I've lived my life and how do I bring that into my business? And I'm excited about that. And I know that it's gonna be hard work. I know that it is putting, you know, tons of stress on me and my family and doing this but I feel like it's going to be worth it at the end. I think so. I can, I can feel your passion for sure. And that's, that's, that's key. You know, it's, it's not something that you wake up and go, Oh my gosh, I have to do this today. No, this is like, this is why I'm here. It's yeah. like you say, you make an impact and that's, what's exciting. You know, it can be the, in the lives of individuals or shaping a corporation and may affect others' lives. It's, it's just wonderful. I, I love your, your whole concept and where you're headed. So what makes you happiest in business and life? I like to spend time with family. Hmm. Um, I think, uh, and, and family is important to me. So that's like key. It's really, really important to me, even though I work a lot of hours, but family is extremely important. In business, what really makes me happy is, is just watching my clients grow mm. and watching people change. So if I'm coaching someone, um, and when I think about the, the team that I've just now spent six months with, Tedco, um, watching their growth, and you know, I, I say to them is I know that I'm not going to be with them a year down the road, 
but I can't wait to see what they're going to do. Mm. And I'm sure they think, oh, she's just talking, but I am so excited for the potential of, you know, so many of the individuals in that organization that it just gives me, it, it you know, makes me feel like I'm a proud mom, right? And, yeah. and I know that they're all, you know, around my age, some of them are, but it really makes me feel like a proud mom because I've been able to lend a hand and there again to make an impact. Mm. Yes, make an impact, definitely. And I'm sure they're all listening. <laughs> I can imagine that they're going to have great takeaways. So tell us something that's not on your resume. You know, I, the thing that's not, that doesn't come through on, um, on my resume. Oops, I think I've lost you there for a minute. Can we go back? There we go. Um, you know, the thing that doesn't go through uh, or come through on my resume, I think it's, it's really the passion that I bring to every single experience and job that I, that I take on. I mean, I think people can look at it and say, oh my God, you know, you've got an amazing resume, but they don't realize like how much I throw myself into anything that I decide to take on. Mm -hmm. And it becomes like, it's almost like a religion, right? I throw myself into it so much because it is about ensuring that I give my best every single day. Mm -hmm. And that may not come through as, as much as I think I would like it to come through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, on paper, it's, it's a little difficult, but your energy definitely when they meet you, uh, they'll feel it because you definitely have the passion and you have the drive. There's no question. So the two together, you're unstoppable <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So is there anything else you would like to share with our audience? Well, the big thing that I probably would, would want to kind of leave them with is that, you know, life is, is tough. It's designed to be tough. It's not designed to be easy. And yes, maybe there are some people who just have it really, really easy, but I don't know too many that, that really don't work extremely hard. And you know, we're going to have a lot of disappointments, but we have to stay focused on what that end goal is for ourselves. And we can't let somebody else kind of define that for us. Mm. We really do have to take the action to define what is it and how are we going to go about it. And even if you say, I have no idea how to do this, now we have the ability to search so much information on the internet, do a Google search, start looking at the resources, start reaching out to people, mm -hmm. reach out to your network. Right. I will tell you that I don't activate my network nearly as much as I should. And we need to get better at that, right? We need to activate our network, go through those business cards, make sure that you're thinking about how you're categorizing them. You know, who's most important? If you get as many business cards as I do, um, you have to think about, okay, who am I going to call back? Where do I put them? You know, I'll put them at the top of the pile because I know I need to go back to this individual. So I, I would say that you be intentional about how you are going to show up. And no matter what you do, just be intentional of how you're going to show up. And that's really what I would, I would leave everyone with. Mm. I love that. Be intentional on how you're going to show up. Yes. Because every day it matters. If you, if, you, if you want it to. Yes, absolutely. And of course, your experiences overseas um, even bring that home more. I know when you experience things firsthand, because we see images on the television and hear things on the radio, but it's just not the same um, as being there you know, the, the whole situation, but yes, absolutely. It puts it in perspective. Where can people connect and, and find you? And I know we're going to have all this information at the end of your bio. What, did you want to share a couple of links with our audience? Absolutely. Well, I'm definitely on LinkedIn. Okay. So um, my LinkedIn profile is, um, if you were to search for me on LinkedIn, Linda Singh, um, I, it would come up. I think I'm like the only Linda Singh or might not be the only one. I think there's a couple of others. If you were to go out to um, Kaleidoscope Effect, 
Um, that's kaleidoscope effect with an A dot com. You can hit on my website and you can also reach out to me there. Um, those are probably the best places. And if you pick up the phone, somebody will actually answer and take a message and then I can get back to you. Um, and those are probably the best places to get hold of me. Okay. Well, we'll certainly have those available on the site as well. And I know that I heard what you were saying is connection is very important. Connection. And it is. Yes, connection. And it doesn't always have to be business associated. Yeah. It can just be connection for a friend or for some advice or just to share a story, yeah. you know, or a recipe <laughs> like I do all the time. Yeah, absolutely. 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 So I have four final questions that I ask of every guest. Um, hopefully they're fun for you. They're simple, so I'll start with the first one. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? The General. <laughs> I love it. Whoa, I love it. What name would you give your character in your epic story? I know this is bad, but Athenia. <laughs> Which one? Athenia. Ah, okay. And how would you characterize your epic life? Wow. Um, I would say turbulent. Uh, I often look at like um, some of those uh, shows, the one that just ended um, with um, Game of Thrones. And I'm just like, yeah, that's my life. You oh. know, fighting every battle, right? So. It's almost like, you know, the Game of Thrones. That's kind of what my life was like. Okay. And then if you had one epic superpower, what would it be and why? Wisdom. Wisdom gives you the ability to really, you know, operate at a much higher level and, and to really transcend. So wisdom. Mm. Yes, that's, I, I, that wisdom would be magnificent superpower for sure so thank you linda so much for coming on the show and sharing your stories your inspiration and your business expertise with us on the value of our choices and how we can turn our passion into profits and now linda and i would love to hear from you so go on over to my facebook page and write a comment tell us what your epic takeaway was from this conversation and remember this is where you imagine create and build a life and business doing what you love. I'm Jane Applegath. Until next time, this is the Epic Vision Zone. Thank you.